Hey y'all, it's Barry. I'm here to cover Unit 6 in my AP Physics 1 class on simple harmonic motion and waves. Um, this is actually kind of a combination of two smaller units that are done in the College Board curriculum, but because they have so much in common, I'm putting them together to do them at the same time. So we have simple harmonic motion, SHM, and waves. All right, first, uh, we basically have all of the big ideas. We've seen uh, one through four up here before, but I want to hit big idea six to add to that list. And hopefully you're starting to see how all these things kind of move together, interactions of objects with other objects and systems and um, mass and charge being a part of all this stuff. And I guess we really still haven't gotten to charge for a large degree because we'll do electricity next. But fields existing in space certainly have a lot to do with all of this. Um, but big idea six here says waves can transfer energy and momentum from one location to another without the permanent transfer of mass. And they serve as a a mathematical model for the description of other phenomena. Now, what's really important there is to note that waves transfer energy and momentum, but not mass. So, so thus far, we've looked at mass moving around, right? Well, we're going back to energy and that transfer of energy and how it stays constant within systems, but, uh, but we're going to look at it without a transfer of mass in these cases. So first thing we want to do is define a wave. And we're going to pretend like this right here is a string attached to a doorknob on a door there, and you give it a little tug on one side, and it sends this wave right through it. And so this wave would be the repeating disturbance that's moving through that, or movement that transfers the energy through matter and space. And the important thing here to note is these little dots, yep, they go up, they come back down, they end up in the same spot they started in, and that's what we mean with saying that they transfer energy but not matter. Those pieces end up right where they started, even though the energy is moving through them and causing this overall um, phenomenon that's happening here, this transfer of energy. So waves must have a medium to travel through, okay? Waves, as we're going to talk about them, do not travel through empty space, okay? And that's a whole different thing that we could get into much later in physics, but for the, the for what we'll be looking at now, they must have some medium, air, solid, something to travel through. Some common examples there are ocean waves traveling through water, earthquakes traveling through land, and sound traveling through air. So we've got some properties of a wave we need to take a look at. First is the frequency. This is going to be the number of wave cycles that pass a point in a given time. So if you were to stand on a pier at the beach and count the number of waves that go by, you could say in an hour, blank waves came by. And so we would say so many waves per hour. The period is the time it would take one wave to complete a full cycle. So if we were to time one of those waves, we would say, okay, it started here. We had the full cycle and it ended here, and so it took blank number of seconds for one wave to go by, okay? So frequency, number of waves per amount of time, period, amount of time for one wave, all right? And they are very related, and we'll get to that. The wavelength is the length of one full wave, and you see in the diagrams here at the bottom, this little lambda, that's our symbol for wavelength, and it's either crest to crest or trough to trough, but either way, um, it has to be one full cycle from highest point to highest point or lowest point to lowest point or middle point to the next middle point over here where, see, it's coming down to the middle here. We would want it coming back down to this, it's called the resting point or the resting location here. Um, again, we can't go just going back up because that wouldn't be the full cycle. That would only be half of one full wave cycle, so half of a wavelength. And then the amplitude is the displacement of a wave in the vertical direction. And that's really to say how high is the crest, how low is the trough, okay? This is measured by that maximum displacement from our rest position, the rest position being our line through the middle here, okay? Now there's two types of waves that we're going to consider. One is transverse waves. And this is what you think of when you thought of a wave before, right? It causes a medium to vibrate at right angles to the direction at which the sound travels. Okay, so the highest point's the crest, lowest is the trough, particles vibrate perpendicular to the direction of motion. And you think about this, you kind of see a spring or a slinky or a rope here, and you go up and down, and it causes this up and down motion, and that will continue so long as you continue to move up and down. If you only do it once, it'll send one full wavelength through the wave here, or through the, the medium, excuse me. And, um, and that's a transverse wave. What you think of as going up and down, and that's the most common type in most people's minds. The problem is it's not the most common type, 
because you've been handling the wave the whole time you've been uh, paying attention to these notes so far. And that is going to be a longitudinal wave. And this is how sound works. And so this is why I say this is the most common type of wave. Although, to be honest, you've also been using transverse waves as you've been watching this because light is a transverse wave. So, um, so we're kind of covering both here to some degree. But longitudinal waves, these... Uh, these are waves that have vibrations in a medium parallel to the direction a sound travels. So instead of having a rope and moving it up and down, think about it like having a slinky in between your hands and pushing on one side and seeing that wave travel down the slinky in that same direction as you see here, as, it, as the energy then moves through um, parallel to the direction of the medium. Okay, this is known as a compression wave or a pressure wave, and this is what's happening with sound. And we're going to get to that in this unit towards the end here also. It works by causing compressions and rarefactions. And rarefactions is really the opposite of a compression. It just means to be stretched out as opposed to compressed in the medium that it travels through. So you send a little bit of energy in it and it compresses these. Well, if it's compressed somewhere, then it must be spread out, rarefacted somewhere else. Okay, that's really what you're looking at. And so we'll get to a bunch of these examples coming up. Um, now, the speed of the wave is an important thing to note. So waves are still going to travel with some speed um, as they move through whatever medium it is. And it's going to depend on how much energy is in the wave and the material that it's traveling through largely. But speed is still meters per second, and it always will be. So it's either going to be the wavelength times the frequency or the wavelength divided by the period. And this relates wavelength and frequency for us here also. A reminder that, uh, that frequency is in time, how much time for one wave, and then wavelength, or uh, I'm sorry, period is in time, how much time for one wave. Frequency is going to be measured in cycles per time, okay? And that's gonna be known as hertz. So we're gonna have speed in meters per second, the wavelength in meters, how long is the wave in meters, and then the frequency would be in this, um, this new uh, unit known as hertz. And it means one over seconds. It's the reciprocal of the period, okay? So the period is gonna be in seconds. The frequency is one over seconds. So hertz are the reciprocal of time. Two hertz is equal to two times one over seconds, or it would be two cycles per second would be a way to say that. Okay, so something with a frequency of two hertz would send two full cycles of the wave in one second. If it had a frequency of one hertz, that means it's going through one cycle of its wavelength every second. And you can see the equation for both down here below. And I realize this is a little bit confusing right now, but we're going to get into some practice with this once we get into the unit. Now, to talk about the energy in a wave, uh, again, they don't transfer matter, and I've said this once before, but this is really important, so I want to make sure that we hammer this point home. They move matter and transfer energy, okay? They move it, but they don't actually transfer matter. The matter goes back to where it was, okay? Energy is passed from molecule to molecule within the medium as the wave travels through the medium. So right here, we have our um, longitudinal wave where these, these pieces hit each other in the same direction, right? and then they continue that motion on. And, and it's largely like momentum. As mentioned very early here, it's a transfer of momentum really is what's going on. Whereas our um, transverse wave we've got right here is we have this object moving up and down and thus the energy transfers outwards and moves another object later on as well. So the transfer of energy being the point there, we wanna make sure that that's something we really hammer home. Now there's a couple behaviors of waves that we need to make sure to hit. Um, first one is reflection. This occurs when a wave strikes, strikes an object and bounces off of it. So you see right here, your reflection, boom, goes in, boom, comes out, okay? And so that's what you see when you look in a mirror. Um, it's what you hear when you hear an echo. It's just a reflected wave. A, re a refracted wave is going to be a bent wave. And this happens when a wave goes from one material to another when it hits that boundary between them. I don't know if you've ever seen before um, a picture of a straw in a glass cup from the side, but it looks like the straw is cut in half. And even though it's a straw like this, it looks like it's cut like this because that light bends as it moves from the air to the water and it appears to be broken apart. Um, refraction here is one of the things that helps cause rainbows as well. Okay, And that's also diffraction, our next one, that um, occurs when a wave is spread apart and that energy is dissipated. 
And so we see something right here, diffracted, a wave coming in. And as it hits this opening, all of the energy can't transfer through this. It only transfers through this medium in the middle. And thus it is spread out and dissipated right here. Okay. Um, another way to think of that, if you've ever been in a boat or, or near a marina, you've seen what's known as a breakwater. There are little walls that, uh, that keep the waves traveling in from hitting the sides of the boats and moving them all over the place. It only comes through then that little opening in the breakwater, and it keeps all the energy from hitting the sides of the boats continuously. Um, now, as waves travel through materials, there can be some change in the way that, uh, that the energy is transferred. So a less dense material means that waves will travel faster. There's less resistance to the wave's energy moving through it. Um, it will mean a, thus a greater wavelength and amplitude for the same amount of energy. And we're seeing this happening at the bottom, and I'll explain a little further in just a sec. But a more dense material will, travel, will have a lower velocity, will travel slower, and um, will have a lower wavelength and amplitude. So what we see here is some amount of energy transferring through this medium. It hits the boundary here where a less dense medium, let's say a piece of string, is tied to a rope, so something denser, and thus this wave transfers. Okay, and we're going to talk about what's happening here with this reflected pulse, why it's coming back below in just a minute. Okay, we'll talk about reflected pulses. But the key here being there is a change in both the velocity of the wave and the wavelength, like the width of it, and the amplitude, the height of it in all these cases. Okay, so less dense material really just makes it easier for the energy to transfer. More dense material makes it harder for the energy to transfer. And that's probably the easy, most the simplest way to think about this. Now, interference. This is something that uh, whenever you've heard an amp or the amplitude of a wave, um, when you talk about a sound wave, that's what this is um, interacting with here is the amplitude here and making interference. So interference is a combination of two or more waves that exist in the same place at the same time. Okay. And so what's happened here is we have constructive interference up in the top. We have two waves with the exact same shape. And what's happening is we're adding them together because they basically overlap and build upon each other. The energy combines and makes for more energy, okay? And so what you've got here as the crest on the left side, well, now we end up with double the crest because those have combined, okay? And so the wave gets larger. This is known as additive interference. So the, the energy is combining and making it more. All right. And then when we have destructive interference, this is instead of an amp turning an amp up or the volume on it up to make the sound louder. These are your noise canceling headphones. All right. They put out essentially what's known as white noise and make destructive interference and reduce background noises by canceling them out by being subtractive. So where the background noise might have a positive crest here. Well, now we have a negative crest put out. The positive here combines with the negative there and makes nothing. And this is how it helps get rid of it. Okay, so that's known as destructive interference. It is subtractive. It reduces the overall um, wave energy that's happening there. Okay, now reflected pulses. I mentioned I would get back to this in just a sec. A pulse is a wave traveling through a medium, and it changes from an incident pulse to a transmitted pulse once it interacts with the medium. And we saw that right here once it hit the boundary right there. Okay, it goes from an incident, the one on the left, goes from incident to reflected once it hits that boundary. OK, some of that energy is being transferred, not quite all of it, because there's a little bit of the pulse still coming back. And that's what we're seeing here as well. Now, that changes depending on the type of boundary that it's hitting. OK, a solid boundary. If we took our rope and we tied it to the doorknob and we hit our pulse through it. It's going to come back as an inverted pulse on the bottom once it interacts with that boundary. Once it, it hits the wall, the door where the doorknob is and it's reflected back it's going to come back inverted, upside down. But if I had, let's say, a ring that was over a pole and it could go up and down as it hit, well, then there's no inversion. There's no uh, um, multiplying by the negative. I'm trying to think of the best way to say that. Apologies. Um, but there's no flipping of that pulse with the interaction because it has the ability to move up and down here. Okay, so that energy isn't having that same effect and it comes back as still being a positive pulse. So on a soft boundary, the soft boundary being one that can move, a reflected pulse matches the incoming pulse. On a, a hard boundary right here, one where it can't, it's inverted and it comes back as a negative pulse. Now, we're going to take these basics of a wave and how a wave interacts, and we're going to look at some objects that move in a similar pattern to this, and that's where we get our simple harmonic motion. 
So time to start talking about this harmonic motion. Harmonic motion is a type of periodic motion. So it's happening with a period, right? So with a certain amount of time, and then it's repeating just like a wave does. Um, and, or it's an oscillated motion. So again, it's going up and down. You see that right here with our spring. And we've talked about springs in the past um, where the restoring force is directly proportional to the displacement. And we've talked about these to some degree, right? There's a force that's pulling it back and then pushing it forward and it continues over and over and acts in the direction opposite of to the displacement. So we've talked about the energy associated with these things, um, with both of these in our mechanical energy unit and how there's a transfer of energy from one to the other and how the force that makes the spring move drives that. But the key here and the part that, that I want to have, and I have this note explained simply, this is a repeating motion due to a restoring force. And the reason we're talking about it with waves is because if we graphed the motion of either one of these objects, it's going to look like this. And so as time goes on, the, if we pull the spring down and let it go, it's going to be up and then go down past the zero point and come back down and then up and down and up and down. And we get a graph that looks like this wave. And same thing with this pendulum going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And so the graph of these harmonic motion items is a wave. And that's why we combine them when we talk about them in this unit. So first, Quick reminder of Hooke's Law. We've ended up talking about this a lot, but this was covered back in dynamics. Hooke's Law refers to the spring constant, that K there, where F equals KX, K being the spring constant, and it corresponds to a source of periodic motion. So the assumption for simple harmonic motion is that there's no friction and it doesn't slow the motion down. Okay, so this would repeat forever. Now, as we've talked about, that's not realistic, right? Um, there's going to be what's known as damping forces, D-A-M-P-I-N-G, damping forces that would be like friction or, um, you know, whatever else it is, air resistance, that's going to slow the motion of some object down as time goes on. We ignore those when we talk about these idealistic situations, but, um, but we got to note that, that in realistic terms, you can't pull a spring down and expect it to bounce back and forth forever. You can't op uh, start a pendulum and expect it to go on forever. Eventually, those things will stop, um, but that's something that will be covered much later in a different physics course. Now, oscillations... This is that regular variation in magnitude or position around a central point. So this is to say, okay, an oscillation is the pendulum goes back and forth and the spring goes up and down and it graphs to be, again, a wave. And that's why this is really important to cover right now. So the period is the time required for one full oscillation. And you see this term, same as what we used before, the period. The frequency is the inverse of the period as mentioned, measured in Hertz. So again, same thing happening here. And the amplitude is the maximum point of oscillation, and that's measured in meters. And these are all terms that we covered with our basics of waves, so hopefully you see why we're talking about simple harmonic motion at the same time. Now, a couple things to look at, or, or our examples at least for now. We're going to look at the simple pendulum first. And you see our force diagram, really in a free body diagram, because we have just the pendulum, the point at the end in this case. Um, and we want to consider the parts here of what's known as the simple pendulum. So um, first we have tension in the string acting upwards, and then we have the weight of it acting downwards, right? And that's it. And some of these we're going to break into components because of how the acceleration changes here. But the key being we have these two forces acting, and they're going to have some combination of the two of them as this moves along. So acceleration of the pendulum um, is going to be at its maximum when it's at its highest point because that is where the tension and the weight will be most off in direction. When they are at the bottom here, there's going to really be no acceleration because you're going to have a, um, a very brief instant where the tension upwards will equal the weight downwards. Now, the reason that it wouldn't be still at a point like that is because it's already got a motion with it and it will continue on to the other side. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And I think this hopefully is a good way to look at this. And there's a lot happening here, so I'm going to describe it slowly to make sure that we see what's going on. So what's happening is we have our pendulum, and it's swinging side to side. And I am using the right GIF first. Yes, it's GIF, not GIF. Don't at me. Um, to make sure that we can see the forces that are acting here, okay? Now, weight is always going to be acting down. That is what it is. It's always going to be in that case. The tension is what's holding the string in place, and that's going to change as the angle increases. So the tension is going to go down as this goes side to side. Well, the tension changing there means that there is some force inwards once it's angled, 
right? Again, once it's at the very bottom here, it's just tension up and weight down. But once it's angled, there's going to be some force pulling towards the center, right? Some portion of this tension pulling in here. Some portion of this tension pulling in here. Well, because there's a force in the x direction in those cases, there must be an acceleration in the x direction that pulls it inwards. And so you see tension or at its max point here, acceleration at its max. At its max point here, acceleration at its max, because these do match up, all right? And so we get this constant motion, and it's driven by that constant change in that tension force, which causes a constant change in the acceleration that centers it back to its hanging point, right? Now, this acceleration changing is what's causing that change in velocity. So as the acceleration points down to the middle there, it causes the velocity to stop and then go in the opposite direction. Stop, go in the opposite direction. And that continues over and over and over as long as the pendulum continues in motion. All right. Now, the note here, and I made this note earlier, and this is why I told you we combine these things. Okay. If we were to allow an object to go through simple harmonic motion, there, we have three lights here, and they shine through and they put a mark on this paper as it hits the ball that's moving side to side. It's going around circle, 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 going through this simple harmonic motion, repeating over and over and over again the same motion. You see that the graph that it would show in the background there is a wave. And this is why we talk about them at the same time. All right. Now, damping forces, if there were forces that were present and we weren't ignoring them, they could um, take away some of the energy that's happening as, as a pendulum is damped, as it's slowed down, as friction takes over, as air resistance takes over. You see how while the frequency stays the same, the amplitude is going to go down. OK, now an example of this, I yell. Someone close to me hears this as a high amplitude, right? Because I'm yelling and they're close by. But as this wave travels, and I know I realize it's a different type of wave, but the example I think fits very well. As this wave travels some distance, my voice gets quieter and quieter and quieter. Because all that air resistance, all that spread out, all that damping of the sound as it travels, of that sound wave, of that wave of energy, it's spread out and it's dissipated, and so the amplitude gets less and less. And so the amplitude, when it comes to sound, is what we associate with the volume. You hear things better, they have a higher amplitude, right? So damping, right, again, a decrease in the amplitude of an oscillation as a result of energy being drained from the system. It overcomes friction or other forces there, and it depends on the specific situation. It's going to depend on the type of wave. It's going to depend on the forces that are present. It's going to be a lot of things that affect that. Um, and if we were to look at a damped pendulum here, right, if it's undamped, it's going to have a force that restores like there, just like we talked about, right? Um, a damped pendulum has a reduction in the force um, that drives it based on all those different forces. And here is a way that you could calculate those damping forces if this was a calculus-based class, but it's not. This is AP Physics 1. It is algebra-based, so yay for algebra instead of calculus in this case, one of the few cases where um, algebra is an easier math to handle um, when dealing with some of these forces. All right, time to get into specifically sound. And sound is a major part of this unit because it has a lot to do with uh, well, there's a lot of properties of it that need to be analyzed is really what it comes down to. So sound, these are waves that are mechanically generated, compressional waves. Um, they're caused by vibrations. So this happens when vibrations move through the air. So a speaker vibrates and makes all those little particles of air bounce off each other. So I send some energy out right now, and that causes all these little air molecules to hit each other. And then those ones hit the next ones, and the next ones, and the next ones, and the next ones. And you see how that transfers outwards or outwards from the bell here to the ear, and thus it causes some transfer of energy. And we're going to talk about what happens when that energy hits your ear also, okay? But as with all waves, they must travel through a medium. Air is a medium. Um, the wave is transferred from the generation point to that hearing point as particles collide, all right? So less air, harder to hear. More air, easier to hear. The speed of sound. Um, boy, oh boy, look at these uh, typos that I have here, huh? Apologies for that. Yeesh. Good thing I don't teach English. Um, the speed of sound depends on the material through which it travels. Okay, this is the case for all waves. The same wave will travel at a different velocity depending on what it goes through. All right, that's really important. Um, the speed increases as the temperature of the material increases, and that's because there's more energy with a higher temperature. And this affects the gases. And um, it's generally considered to be 343 meters per second. That is our general speed of sound. Okay. 
Now that's going to vary. If you're at sea level versus on top of a mountain, it will literally be different, okay? On a day that's high pressure versus low pressure, it could be different. So 343, you might see a problem later on where um, it actually gives you a different value and realize that that's fine. Just use the value that it gives you. All right, so we want to make sure we use, again, the value that it gives you. Um, the intensity and the level of sound. So the intensity is going to be the amount of energy that a sound wave carries, um, and it's going to uh, be measured as the energy moving past the point in a second. Now, this isn't really something that you're going to have like a specific necessarily um, unit for, but it's how we're going to refer to the amplitude of a wave here. So more energy is going to be a higher amplitude. Now, the pitch is different. So the intensity, the loudness, will be based on the amplitude. The pitch and the way that humans perceive the frequency of sound is going to be based on the frequency. Okay? So amplitude, intensity, amplitude, volume. Um, frequency is the pitch and the difference in pitches that you hear. And so we see over here the difference in the amplitude. Okay, a difference in the amplitude being a difference in the intensity, a difference in the volume there. Okay, whereas a difference in the frequency, how many waves are passing in a certain amount of time, would be the difference in the pitch. All right, and uh, I mean, that's something just to kind of consider and think about. Okay, different people's voices are different. Well, that literally happens because people's vocal cords are different. Right, you have vocal cords in your neck, and if you hold your neck while you talk, you feel them vibrate, and that's what sends out that wave that uh, that causes compressions in your ear, and thus you hearing. Um, but it's the actual length of those and the vibrations that come from those before they're tunneled out of your mouth and thus traveling through the air that causes these differences in pitch. Right now, the intensity is going to be based on how much energy I put into it. So if I put more energy into it, it's going to be louder. If I put less energy into it, it's going to be quieter. All right, so the amount of energy I put into my voice is what determines the intensity, but it's the actual length of my vocal cords that determine the pitch. And you can try to change the pitch by changing the vocal cords and stretching the vocal cords. But for the most part, you have a set pitch based on the length of your vocal cord. All right, resonance, and this is a tough one, okay? Resonance is something that is um, how waves interact within a medium. So all waves, when sent out, will have what's known as a natural frequency. This is the frequency at which the system vibrates when not connected to an external force. So you have something that can hold a wave, um, let's say an instrument, right? A saxophone, a trombone, or whatever it might be. It holds a wave. It can hold a specific wave that would have a natural frequency that would vibrate through it and thus cause some sort of sound to come out. Okay, And you can alter that by on your trombone moving your slide or on your saxophone pushing down the different keys on a guitar changing the way that you're holding the strings this would change the natural frequency of the string on the guitar or the sound wave that comes out of um, a saxophone or a trombone okay and these combine then to make standing wave patterns so these are vibrational wave patterns that are continuously reflected within an object so as you change the shape or you push the keys or you change the string, how you hold the string on these different instruments, you can change the standing wave patterns that come out. And thus you change what you hear. And this is why instruments can make different sounds, right? Resonance is a form of constructive interference that leads to objects within the same natural frequency influencing each other, okay? So again, something resonates when you have two objects that have the same natural frequency. So if you have three guitars sitting next to each other and you don't hold the strings at all, you just walk up and you strum all of the strings on one of the guitars, the strings on the other two will begin to vibrate because the energy put out by the one hits the strings on the other. It will resonate because this is two or three, excuse me, not two, three objects that have all the same natural frequency and thus that energy transfer in that case will actually cause vibration of the strings of the other guitars. That's known as resonance. The, so in summary here, and to put all three of these terms together, objects vibrate at their natural frequencies, which leads to standing wave patterns. So again, the natural frequency, I strum the guitar. This leads to the standing wave pattern, the sound wave that's emitted. These standing wave patterns, they affect nearby objects once they hit them, causing other objects with the same natural frequency, the two other guitars, to also vibrate and thus generating a resonance. And they all combine. 
And this is why a lot of times you want to combine instruments when you have a band or something like that, because it makes for a stronger, a better formed sound overall. Um, so in instruments, you'll also see things known as harmonics, right? And a harmonic and the number of waves you might see here in standing wave patterns has to do with the, um, the overall number of what's known as nodes and anti-nodes available. So a way to look at this. If we look at this standing wave pattern right here, and this one's marked with it, a node is every point where the wave hits the rest position. An anti-node is at its peak or its trough in each of these cases. Okay, so a node where it hits the rest position, an anti-node is where it's at its peak or at its trough. All right, and there's your standard wave pattern there. Node, anti-node, node, anti-node, node, anti-node, anti so forth and so on. All right. The number that are there and that are that's resonating within a an instrument causes what's known as a harmonic. Okay, a harmonic is a natural frequency of an instrument associated with different standing wave patterns. So the first harmonic, and the people who are in band who are watching this are loving this because you understand a lot of this already. But the first harmonic would be half of a wave, two nodes, one anti node. The second harmonic, three nodes two anti-nodes. And then we just add another half of a wavelength each time. And so that puts together an overall idea of how we can look at these harmonics overall. Okay? So we have the first harmonic here being two nodes and one anti-node. The second, three nodes, one, two, three, two anti-nodes, one, two, and so forth and so on. A good way to remember this is the number harmonic that you might have is the same as the number of anti-nodes in the wave, the number of crests and or troughs. And this is important because it's gonna help us identify waves coming up here. So you might see in a problem, okay, um, a sound wave of the third harmonic exists um, in a, an instrument that's a meter or long. Well, you could determine the wavelength then, given that there's one and a half waves in that meter, okay? And so you could find that it's actually two thirds of a meter for the wavelength. And so that's something we'll get some practice with coming up here. Um, the next thing to talk about is a really interesting one here. It's known as the Doppler effect. And you have experienced this phenomenon. If you've ever been driving down the road um, and you've had some sort of car, whether it be a police car or an ambulance or a fire truck, go by you with its um, siren blaring. You've noticed that as it's coming up on you, it has a slightly different sound than when it goes past you. Okay? And this is known as the Doppler effect. It's a phenomenon that causes a change in the frequency of a wave as the source and observer move towards or away from each other. And so for sound waves, the most example here, you've got a siren, um, and it's interpreted differently as either the sound or source passes the other way. This only happens if the, the source of the sound and the source of the hearing are traveling at different velocities. So as in you driving down the road, and then you have to pull over, right? So it can pass you or at least slow down. Well, you have different velocities and so it moves past you. An observer here that's not moving at all is going to experience this to an even greater degree because there's gonna be an even greater difference in the velocities of the object creating the sound and the people interpreting the sound. And before it, it's because this is, all of these waves as they're generated and moving outwards travel at the speed of sound. But as this object also travels, then these waves end up bunched up a little more and these spaced out a little more because not only are they emitted outwards at the speed of sound, but the source is traveling. And so here it's pushing them together a little more and here it's spreading them out a little more. And so you see the lower frequency behind the siren and the higher frequency in front of it. And that's what you see right there with the waves spread apart or bunched up together, okay? The next one that's a really interesting phenomenon is known as a sonic boom. And it's really the next level of the Doppler effect. So as objects travel through the air, they emit pressure waves through the air particles, right? That's what's happening here, is, is the pressure and the, the pushing together of these particles in the air is what's causing this noise to, to travel, right? So the faster an object travels, the more pressure is generated in the waves. And a sonic boom is when an object, typically like an airplane or some other object that can travel at at least the speed of sound and thus go past it, travels faster than that speed of sound. And in that case, the pressure waves generated build up upon each other until released in the form of a loud sound, okay? 
So you've got here plane traveling or er, stopped. It starts to move there. It's moving to the point where it's at the speed of sound. And if you were in front of this plane, you would never hear it if this was the case. Because the speed of sound would never get to you. Now, once it goes past the speed of sound, you have an overlap from the front to the back of this, of the sound waves as they're generated, and they make it louder overall. Okay? So, excuse me, my chair is falling down. And I also have another typo. Fun stuff. Now, this double boom is the first um, when the nose of the aircraft causes the change in the pressure, and the second is when the tail causes that change in the pressure. And if you go to YouTube real quick and just look at sonic booms, you can visually see the overlap in air par uh, particles at the back of a plane as it passes the speed of sound. All right, so we'll look at one of those in class, I'm sure, but um, if you're interested, um, pause me real quick, open a new YouTube channel, and, uh, and check it out. It's pretty interesting. And again, we see that happening here, that overlap. I like this slightly 3D visual a little bit more. So, um, but you see the same thing happening there. This is how that boom is created. It's an overlap of the sound waves um, once you move past that speed of sound. Now we have to talk real quick about a quick, quick, quick biology topic here. Um, so there are some parts to the human ear that allow you to hear things. Now there's a physics explanation as to how those work. And that's why we're gonna talk about this. There are three major parts to the uh, organ known as the ear. There's the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And the outer is what's visible in the ear canal, and these just collect sound. The reason they are this funny shape is so that sound as it's coming towards it is directed down and into your ear canal. The middle ear is the eardrum and three little bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And they have other names, but that's for biology class. Um, and they work as an amplifier, okay? They amplify that little bit of energy because sometimes it can be really hard. I mean, if someone's whispering on the other side of the room, they may not be transferring much energy that can be um, gathered within your ear. So you might need that amplified overall there. And then the inner ear, uh, there's a cochlea bone in there that interprets sound waves um, that are amplified in the middle ear and it transmits that signal to the brain. So it says, okay, this sound means this and it sends it to your brain through an auditory nerve and your brain interprets it, and you respond or think about something or just continue watching Netflix or whatever it is that you might be doing as you're listening to this stuff, that's what's going on there, right? And I liked the visual here a little bit as well, where you've got your outer ear here and the traveling in of the, uh, of the compressional wave. Um, it goes down the ear canal, it hits that eardrum, it moves through these little bones, and then eventually here is, is going through the cochlea and interpret it and it goes through the auditory, the hearing nerve into your brain. And that's how you hear, it's because those vibrational waves travel and they, uh, they travel down into your ear and bounce around on that little drum. All right, so, Again, we had our big ideas one, two, three, four, and we had this new one six where waves can transfer energy and momentum from one location to another without the permanent transfer of mass. And this serves as a mathematical model for the description of other phenomena. So I hope you, uh, hope you learned something new today and uh, we'll continue to expand upon this stuff in this unit. Thanks for being here.